this is the last lecture in the series, and I'm going to talk about nanostructured steels. So all of these processes keep the shape constant, but um, you know, cold deform the material in such a way that we get a very fine grain structure. This uh, is a process called torsion compression, where you have a small sample between a rotating and a stationary support, and there's also pressure applied. So it's torsion and compression. And the advantage of this process is that you can apply very large strains because there's no possibility of uh, the sample breaking. Um, so, you know, strains of the order of 16 have been reported for some of the samples that have been deformed using this process. But the obvious uh, disadvantage is that you produce a very, very small sample. Then we have uh, equichannel angular extrusion, in which you force a piece of steel through an angle like this, and that introduces redundant deformation inside your material. And when it comes out, you can repeatedly put it through this process. And that means that you can accumulate plastic strain and once again get a refined structure which is severely cold deformed. This is an interesting process. It's called accumulative roll bonding invented by Professor Suji in Japan, where basically you have plates stacked on one, one another and you roll it. And then you, after it comes out thinner, you chop it up, stack them up again and return them into the roll. So again, you are maintaining the shape of the sample, but in every single pass, you are uh, introducing more and more deformation. So all of these processes preserve the shape of the product, and you end up with a severely cold worked sample, which may be quite hard and uh, it is said to be strong, but of course, you need a combination of properties to make use of such materials. The other process which produces uh, nanostructures uh, is, of course, uh, wire drawing, which I talked about in the lecture on perlite. So here, you know, the shape of the sample will be altered, and you're looking at a mixture usually of phases like cementite and ferrite. And by putting in strains uh, of the order of three or four, you can get extremely strong steel wire. So this is an atom probe image where each dot represents a single atom. And you can see here that you've introduced coherent crystal domains, which are incredibly small by taking, for example, a 50 gram sample and stretching it out into two kilometers by wire drawing. So here you can achieve a strength of the order of five gigapascals. In uh, so this is a commercial wire that was produced by Kobe Steel in Japan. Uh, the normal tire cord would be about four gigapascals in strength. And piano wire, which uh, most people know about, but they don't understand that it's actually politic steel wire, is of the order of three gigapascals. Uh, you can get stainless steel wires. Uh, amorphous steel uh, is about four gigapascals in strength, although it undergoes a plastic instability very quickly. Tungsten wire, this is uh, the so-called Kevlar, it's about three gigapascals and carbon fiber is of the order of three and a half gigapascals. So it's possible to produce fibers or wires of steel are incredibly strong, but of course you are limited to a particular shape, which is the shape of a thin wire. Okay. So if you want to make a, a bulk material, that is not possible using this process. Now the word nanostructure, I haven't defined as yet. What do we mean by nanostructure? Because, you know, at one point there was a lot of funding for research in this area and people were just calling things nano, nano everywhere. We even had a car called the Nano, Tata Nano, and of course you had the Nano musical device from uh, Apple. So here are different kinds of processes that are illustrated. I will talk about nanostructured bainite later, but the length scale, the size of the coherent domains is of the order of 20 to 40 nanometers. 
which means that there is a huge amount of surface interface per unit volume, about a hundred million square meters per cubic meter of interfacial area. And therefore, this material is very strong. Yeah. Others have used the term nanobainite for length scales of 200 to 400 nanometers, but those are not really nanostructured because the strength levels are really quite small. The amount of interface per unit volume, interfacial area per unit volume, is much less than in this. Uh, mechanical milling produces, uh, uh, again, a length scale of 20 nanometers and something that is extremely hard. Uh, nanoparticle, but this is in a cold deformed condition, okay? Uh, nanoparticle strengthening, of course, has been known for a long time, uh, and we mustn't confuse that with nanostructure because these are simply precipitates which are small and they contribute to a very small amount of interfacial area per unit volume, so the strength is of the order of 800 megapascals. Accumulative roll bonding has been reported to produce uh, steel with a strength of the order of 800 megapascals, 900 megapascals. Severe plastic deformation of the types that I illustrated and equal channel angular processing. Okay. Now I've emphasized that we mustn't just look at strength. Okay. Uh, but the meaning of a nanostructure is that you have an exceptional amount of interfacial area per unit volume. So I would say that nanostructure corresponds to this this region of the curve. The, where the amount of interface per unit volume rises sharply as the length scale decreases. So here, for example, we have 100 million square meters of interface per cubic meter. You, you change that, change the length scale to 50 nanometers, and you get a sharp reduction in the amount of surface and a corresponding sharp reduction in strength as you go, go to uh, larger and larger length scales. So, smaller amounts of interfacial area per unit volume. So if you can get a structure in which the interfaces are separated by something of the order of 20 nanometers, then that genuinely is a nanostructure which will have exceptional properties. All the other examples that I give you don't really produce exceptional properties. Now, there is one problem with small grain sizes. Okay. Normally, we like small grain sizes because they increase the strength and sometimes also increase the toughness of the material. But that isn't the case when you go to extremely small grain sizes. And that's illustrated over here with uh, classic experiments done by Professor Suji and his colleagues in Japan, where when we have a grain size of two micrometers in an interstitial free iron, you've got a strength of the order of two to 400 megapascals. But you have a very large elongation, something like 35% before the onset of plastic instability. As soon as you reduce the grain size by an order of magnitude, as soon as plastic deformation starts, you immediately get a plastic instability. So the elongation is more or less uh, zero in terms of uniform elongation and total elongation is uh, you know, of the order of 7%. So ductility drops dramatically as you reduce the grain size. And the reason for this is when you make the grains extremely small, uh, you get a very low dislocation density inside the grains. And that means you reduce the work hardening capacity of the material. And that is the reason why you get plastic instability early in the process of deformation. So you've got to introduce a work hardening mechanism. Now, all of the processes that I illustrated, like uh, equal channel angular processing, torsion compression, and uh, accumulative roll bonding, they don't result in large samples, samples which are large in all three dimensions. So just to illustrate to you, I want to make something that is big. So this is at the oil sands mine in Canada. And you can see the scale of just the tire of this truck compared with a human. And we want to make really big objects out of really strong steel, uh, 
And that cannot be done using any processes like accumulated roll bonding, uh, equal channel angular processing, or compression torsion. You simply don't have a combination of properties that you need, nor can you make the material large in all three dimensions by wire drawing, for example. So that's a problem that we have to address. How do we make bulk? Because bulk also has uh, been used in a corrupted way. You know, so for example, uh, you know, a person working on metallic glass will think one centimeter cube is a bulk material, but we are here talking about hundreds of millions of tons of steel in, uh, in large dimensions. Now, there is another problem when you try to make large components out of, um, uh, by, by thermomechanical processing. So thermomechanical processing has been extremely successful, you know, microalloy steels, uh, in reducing the grain size to something of the order of, uh, you know, a few micrometers in hundreds of millions of tons of steel, right? And I show you this graph in the lecture on ferrite, where this is the theoretical prediction of the smallest grain size that you could achieve by getting fine austenite grains and then fine ferrite grains, okay? But in practice, this is the curve that you obtain and almost all commercial steels are in this regime. And the reason is that when you are processing a bulk sample, the heat of transformation heats up the material. So the undercooling at which the structure is generated is reduced, even though you may have a low transformation temperature the temperature rises because of the heat of transmission, and you end up with a coarser microstructure than theoretically predicted. So we've got to have some mechanism by which heat of transformation is minimized. Okay. So if you want to achieve bulk nanostructured steel, we've got to introduce a mechanism for work hardening inside our material. You also need to store the heat of transformation inside the material. You want a slow rate of transformation because then the heat can diffuse away. The, the enthalpy of transformation can diffuse away. And transforming at a low temperature is good for getting a fine structure by phase transformation. So we don't want to use cold deformation to produce a nanostructure. We want to generate the structure by phase transformation. And that way we can make samples which are large in all three dimensions. Now, first of all, how do we store heat? Well, the transformations which release the least heat of transformation are those which store the heat in the form of elastic strains. If you are making very thick samples, then probably martensite is not the right, uh, right structure to think about. But in the case of bainite, you know, the displacements associated with the transformation store quite a lot of energy inside the material in the strain fields of the shape deformation. Okay, so that's good. So using a displacive transformation will give us uh, heat of transformation stored inside the material. And therefore less is released and the recalescence problem is reduced. Now, the second aspect is we need to introduce a work hardening capacity. And in my lecture on trip steels, it was obvious how to do that. You know, we basically generate a structure which consists of plates of ferrite and carbon enriched retained austenite. And we stop the reaction here by using silicon. And the deformation induced transformation of the austenite automatically gives us a work hardening mechanism because when it transforms under the influence of stress or strain, it will produce hard martensite. In other words, you've hardened your structure to any local instabilities by the trip effect. Okay, so here is the structure that I showed you in the third lecture. Beautiful fine plates of bainitic ferrite and separated by regions of carbon enriched retained austenite. But the scale here is one micrometer and I want to produce a nanostructure. And uh, some, uh, quite a few years ago now, 
Francisca Caballero, who was working in Cambridge, she's now uh, at Senim. She's a professor at Senim in Spain. Uh, she uh, worked on the problem of how to refine this structure. And we did some calculations to see what is the lowest temperature at which you could get bainite. And we discovered that actually you could get it as low as you want. There's no lower limit to the temperature. The only problem is that the transformation time increases quite dramatically. Okay. So, you know, with a composition like this, it would take us a hundred years before transformation begins. So we are achieving the goal of a slow transformation and therefore very little recalescence. But you know, unlike wine, the steel producer is not going to wait for a hundred years to get the product. So we designed uh, an alloy containing about one weight percent carbon, which should take roughly 10 days for the transformation to complete. And it's a very simple alloy. You can see here, one weight percent carbon, uh, the silicon to stop carbide formation, and some hardenability and molybdenum to pin down phosphorus atoms and therefore stop embrittlement. You know, this is something you need to be careful about when you're dealing with um, uh, strong steels. Strong steels are very susceptible to embrittlement at the austenite grain boundaries by elements like phosphorus. So we predict uh, that if we transform at 200 degrees centigrade, this should take about 10 days to form. Uh, we've got uh, manganese and chromium for hardenability, silicon for eliminating the cementite, and a small amount of vanadium to ensure that we don't get a coarse austenite grain size and uh, molybdenum to pin down the phosphorus. And this is the structure we obtained after 10 days of transformation at a temperature where, you know, Italians would cook pizza, okay? So one thing I want you to note is that this is an isotropic structure, you know, we don't expect any anisotropy in this. And when I show you a transmission electron micrograph of this, it's quite amazing. But bear in mind that we are looking at a very small region, so the structure will not look isotropic. So this is the transmission electron micrograph, and this is a carbon nanotube at the same magnification. So we produce bainite plates, which are of the order of 20 nanometers in thickness, 20 nanometers in thickness, finer than carbon nanotubes and separated by these films of austenite. And this was our predicted uh, or calculated time temperature transformation diagram. And these are the experimental data from uh, Francisca and uh, Carlos Mateo's work in Cambridge. And by controlling the transformation temperature, we can alter the properties, achieve something of the order of 2.2 gigapascals in, in strength. And yet we can get toughness going from something like 28 uh, megapascal root meters to 50 megapascal root meters, okay? And a combination of other properties. You can also make this in large quantities. So this really is bulk nanostructured uh, bainite. In the rolled condition here, it is not in fact the nanostructure bainite, but it's got the composition that I mentioned earlier. And then you open up the rolls and you trans uh, cut them up and you transform them into sheets of nanobainite, um, which are of the order of 12 millimeters in thickness. Uh, obviously, if this was nanobainite, you would not be able to coil it at all. all right? So this is transformed into perlite and then reheated after cutting it up into uh, plates. And one application for this is ballistic armor. So here is a movie to show you the bulk nanostructured bainite being fired at by uh, some terrifying threats, okay? Um, so the purpose is to destroy the projectile, right? While keeping the armor intact. So because of the toughness of the armor and because we've got a series of holes in the armor, uh, we don't get total fracture of the plate. You can actually, uh, I've got a sample uh, in my house where the, the whole of the armor has been shot in many different places and still survives as an integral unit. Now, of course, uh, there is a backing plate at, uh, yeah, so that's the 
this is the backing plate here to contain the debris. But the purpose is to destroy the projectile because even the edges of the holes help to destroy the projectile. So if I show you a parameter which is known as the ballistic mass efficiency, this is the mass of an ordinary armor to defeat a given threat and the mass of a test material to defeat a threat. And the higher this value, the better. Okay, so this is the conventional armor steel. These are titanium alloys. And alumina can also act as an armor, but it can't take multiple shots. And this is uh, our super bainite when it contains those holes. Okay, um, of course, uh, the armor application, anything we do in material science, somebody in the military will want to exploit. But more interesting applications have also been attempted. For example, these are blanks of the nanostructured bainite uh, being heat treated in Germany. Uh, first of all, austenitized and then transferred into a salt bath here at 200 degrees centigrade to generate the bainite for aero engine shafts. Okay. And my colleagues in China uh, have produced rolling elements for large bearings. So the rolling elements are like uh, cylinders. Okay. Uh, sometimes in bearings you have balls, sometimes you have cylindrical rolling elements. So these are cylindrical rolling elements made from nanostructured bainite uh, for large bearings. And these two uh, also translated my uh, Bainite in Steel's book, the third edition, into the Chinese language. So if there are any Chinese listening, you can buy the book in uh, uh, Chinese for a reasonable price. OK, so let me just summarize. This is our nanostructured Bainite, and it is very strong. It has a large uniform ductility. And because of the retained austenite transforming under the influence of defamation, it doesn't require any deformation to produce it. There's no rapid cooling required. It takes 10 days to form. And therefore, you won't have distortions of your samples as a consequence of transformation. And it's very cheap and uniform in large sections. So if you do a hardness scan across the cross section of that shaft, it's very uniform, right? Because you know the whole of the shaft reaches the right temperature before transformation starts. So what is the problem? Okay, so you know I've only talked about things like rolling elements in bearings, the armor, and um, shafts. The problem is you cannot weld this. So Fabio told me that we've got a couple of people escaping from Ukraine who are from the Patton Welding Institute, and that is one of the most famous uh, welding institutes in the world. Uh, they've invented many different welding processes. This material cannot be welded, okay? With its high carbon concentration, you will spontaneously crack the material in front of your eyes as you weld it. Now, there are some very exotic welding processes which are not really practical, which you can use, but frankly speaking, uh, you, we need to design a bulk nanostructured steel that is weldable. And I had a really clever postdoc uh, called Matthew Peet, and he was uh, assigned the task to design a steel with an impossible combination of properties. That means a strength greater than two gigapascals, 30% ductility, also at a high strain rate, uh, toughness and sharp impact at minus 40 degrees centigrade, so the nanostructured bainite has uh, very little sharpie impact energy uh, of the order of five joules at room temperature. Uh, it should be valuable, cheap, large in all dimensions, and suitable for mass production. So we came up with this scheme that we want to refine the austenite grain size to a ridiculously small size of the order of 0.4 of a micrometer, right? Before it transforms into martensite. So we are not going to use bainite this time, but martensite uh, and fine crack resisting martensite. I'll explain why, why how we do this. Uh, we want toughness. We want um, austenite there, but in fact, the alloy that we designed didn't contain any austenite. Uh, ductility, 
and weldability more than anything else. Okay. Why did I imagine that we could make a high carbon martensite, which is ductile and crack resisting? Well, uh, some years, uh, some decades ago, one of my PhD students, Saurabh Chatterjee, did this work where we looked at a high carbon, one weight percent carbon steel, and we altered the austenite grain size. As you can see, this is uh, 400 micrometers to 25 micrometers. And these are martensite plates, which crack spontaneously because, uh, you know, untempered high carbon martensite. But as we reduce the grain size, the cracks disappear. Now, the reason is that this distance between the cracks is a stress transfer distance from the matrix to the martensite plate. So if you make your martensite plates finer than the stress transfer length, then they will not crack under the influence of a stress. So that's the reason why we wanted an extremely fine uh, austenite grain structure. And we've limited the carbon concentration to 0.35 weight percent for weldability. Uh, we have about uh, three weight percent of nickel in there so that just after hot rolling at a very low finish rolling temperature, you end up with martensite on the production line. And this uh, illustrates to you the severely pancaked austenite grain structure because we we finished the rolling of this material at a temperature less than 800 degrees centigrade. So the austenite grains are left severely pancaked, but also containing large uh, number density of deformation bands. So all of this cuts the austenite grain size into a very small size of the order of uh, a quarter of a micrometer. I'll show you the evidence for that shortly. And this is uh, using conventional uh, theory. So these are the very small vanadium carbide precipitates because you can't use niobium if you have if you want to maintain uh, if you want uh, the particles to precipitate at a temperature not far from the finished rolling temperature. Okay, uh, when uh, niobium in a high carbon steel would precipitate very quickly at 1200 degrees centigrade, whereas vanadium is a less stable carbide, so you can use it for micro alloying at lower finished rolling temperatures. Now, I'm going to illustrate to you uh, the crystallographic grain size in a very different way to what you are used to. I'm going to show you the texture of the martensite in a single one of these pancaked austenite grains and compare it with the texture of martensite in a, in a grain structure that uh, has not been deformed in the same material. Okay, so undeformed austenite and severely deformed austenite. Okay, so this is the electron, uh, uh, a pole figure, 100 pole figure obtained from a single grain of austenite, which is not deformed, right? And, you know, these are the orientations, the 24 orientations in which we expect martensite. In the deformed material, and remember these angular ranges are very large, instead of getting just 24 orientations, you get thousands of orientations because all these coherent regions of austenite are in many different orientations because of the deformation. So you've refined the austenite grain size dramatically so that inside what used to be one austenite grain, you end up with thousands of martensite orientations. And that is good for toughness, because if you recall the earlier lectures, anything that deflects a cleavage crack is a good thing for cleavage toughness, okay? So these are results for the nanostructured bainet. And this is the new steel that we've developed uh, along with Tata Steel in India. Uh, you can see consistently a toughness of 75 megapascal root meters, right? And no cracking when you weld it, okay? No cracking at all. So even in the heat affected zone, so this is about 0.35 weight percent of carbon. 
And we, we have uh, two uh, applications that we are looking at, one of which could be uh, a large scale application and one which, uh, you know, depends. So this is one application where we want to look at a blast resistance steel. So a blast means a sudden distributed load, right? So it's not like ballistic where you have a projectile hitting the armor. And in the laboratory, the way we test is we fire at a high velocity uh, an aluminum foam onto the steel, and then we see how much it deflects and whether it breaks or not, okay? So this is a, a, a oops, sorry. This is a movie showing that. So this survived the test for blast resistance, okay? Now, the other application, which I think could become very big uh, and is undergoing industrial trial, is impact abrasion. That means you're not just abrading the steel, uh, you know, this has a strength of more than two gigapascals, but you are also impacting it with rocks. And for this, we collaborated with um, Tampere University in Finland because they have a really nice uh, setup for all kinds of wear tests. And the movie that I'm going to show you next is a slow motion movie reduced by a factor of 300, where you have our steel samples uh, impacting against granite. So this is uh, reduced by a factor of 300 uh, in velocity. But this is a, a way for testing for both impact and abrasion. So this is very severe um, abrasion and damage caused by the impact, initial impact of the particle, and the particle then may be dragged across the surface for abrasion. So this is a scanning electron microwave taken by Aparao Chinta, my PhD student, uh, after we received the samples back from Finland. And you can see these are regions of abrasion, very clear regions of abrasion, and then the damage caused by impact as well. Okay, so this is very severe. And, you know, you can think uh, of putting this on the lorries for which are dumper trucks for minerals and various other aspects. But we proved that our material immediately after hot rolling and with a hardness of the order of 570 has the best wear resistance compared with <coughs> commercially available steels. And then, you know, if we, if we reheat treat it so that the austenite is no longer deformed and transform it into martensite again, then the wear rate increases quite dramatically, okay? And that proves the role of the extremely fine structure that we have. And we did some other experiments to see whether we could improve, but immediately after hot rolling, the material performs extremely well. Now, you can never claim success until you actually use this material in industry, in an application. So about two years ago, uh, this is a, a particular uh, structure at uh, Tata Steel where minerals are falling onto a plate. Okay? And those minerals eventually cause the erosion of the steel plate in a, in a quite a massive way. So this steel plate is mild steel but it's coated with a hard-facing chromium carbide containing alloy. Okay, so uh, this is deposited by welding onto the surface of a mild steel, but after a while, it suffers quite a lot. Now, we put our material, which has no coating on it, into this system, and up to now, we haven't found significant damage on the material. Uh, Unfortunately, these tests uh, obviously have to be allowed to continue until uh, you know, the material fails. So we haven't done any studies on the samples that are in location. The interesting thing also is that these materials are quite cheap. So if I plot ultimate tensile strength, so this is a, a colleague of mine um, uh, created this slide for me. 
um, Peter Brown, where we have ultimate tensile strength and Chappie energy at minus 40 degrees centigrade. And we set the cost of a low alloy uh, steel as one here. Uh, medium alloy steel, the cost would be four. And you know these are materials like AMET 100, which are extremely costly. Now our alloy has a cost of two because it has about three and a half to eight percent nickel in it. And yet it has properties which rank with things like AMET 100 and 300M steel and so on, which are aerospace materials. What uh, I would like you to take away from today's lecture and from the previous lectures is that by using you know, phase transformation theory, you can actually create completely new concepts in steels. So for example, the bulk nanostructured steel, the rail steel that I talked about earlier, and now, you know, you can actually get martensite, which you don't need to temper, and yet is tough and contains a high carbon concentration, 0.35 rate percent. We, we have to modify the books to say, which always say that martensite in the S quench condition is brittle. It need not be brittle, okay? You simply have to make the structure fine enough. So I will stop there today and uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, I've really enjoyed this course of lectures. Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all of us that we must uh, thank you for everything. This uh, last lecture, I must say, as for me, it was particularly enjoyable because we, we saw so many perspective ideas and so on and perspectives for the future, which is uh, which is uh, presently my 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 mind my my hope uh, that uh, we are trying to do something for for the steel now and and something for the steels uh, for for future happy some way to see that uh, there is still uh, a lot of room uh, for developing something uh, uh, as uh, let, let's say i'm talking about industrial solutions uh, using steel because uh, sometimes uh, we are told that uh, well there is no nothing more to discover about uh, about steel so everything has already been been written so there are let's say uh, uh, a, a limited amount of uh, possibilities and everything has already been discovered well it looks like uh, uh, there are still many more op opportunities to develop to develop better steels uh, and so i'm uh, I'm very, very happy to have the possibility as I'm working in a steel mill uh, to try to develop new solution together with my teams uh, of, uh, of R&D people. So it was really just, uh, just a general uh, re remark to say thank you to you again for this.